Thank you so much. I'm going to start the timer because uh, I always run out of time, so sorry if I do, then I'll just speed up. I always have a lot of slides, so uh, because I'm more focused on the visual material. There's lots of visual material in this topic, so I only show you just a few. And it's kind of a, has this long durée perspective. So even though we are here to speak about the Hasbro's and Hasbro's relations to Native America, a show that this has a long term, uh, the relationship uh, with the Hungarians to Native America has this long term history. And Hasbro comes in with just one uh, part. So I'm a geographer and global historian, and I'll be speaking about Indian play in Hungary. Uh, which is identifying with and playing out, or representing, comparing to, or performing Native Americans by whites. So it presumes that you are white, as you will usually see. Uh, and just a short terminological remark, so I will refer to the Indian as a constructed figure, and the Native American as Native Americans themselves. Now I understand that Native and Indigenous peoples are used and there are much more very specific identities, tribe languages, which are often mixed up, which we talked about yesterday. In this case, it will be usually, there's also like North and South America, but this is usually about, in a place about the Plains Indian trope, and we well know, we all know. So I will argue for the uh, need to include Central and Eastern European perspectives, and the Eastern European, I think, is uh, key here because there's a lack of comparative study and about uh, studies about geographical differences and shared history. So I'd like to push that in the discussion. Uh, there's also a German Germany in Indian play, even Hitler liked playing Indian or fantasizing with the Indian show. For him, history was the wild East. He kind of copied uh, also eugenics, racial thought, but also the Indian show of the US. We could talk about networks of hobbyists and scouts and also competition in claims to authenticity geographically. So my initial question is, what does whiteness behind Indian mask mean when playing out a non-white position in Eastern Europe? So does it make a difference when we are in Eastern Europe or not? Critical literature on racism Bonzim has remained West-centric and often ignores Eastern European positions. Usually there's Occidentalism, so Hungarians are considered whites. And decolonial, decolonial criticism around cultural appropriation by whites in the case of Native Americans, like red facing, racial stereotyping, or colonial, colonial culture, as it has been highly politicized. So, we'll talk about the sport mascots in the USA, and there are new documentaries on this. Uh, drawing on this and trying to apply it to the Hungarian or East European context may, may result in West centric conceptual issues which do not engage with the actual local histories. And I want to reflect on this with uh, taking into account the rising stakes of colonial criticism in the region at, as it has also been captured by government rhetoric. And also with the war in Ukraine, you see this heightened discourse of we must apply decolonialism and also there's a colonial history this year. So the departure from here will be Hasbro colonialism which culminated in the 1848 independence war against the Austrians. And it shows how the Indian trope constructed during the 19th century feeded into this discourse by casting the Indian as a solidarity or comparative figure to Hungarian anti-colonial struggles. It will also show how white innocence has been constructed, uh, especially through memory and knowledge politics. So it has a longer term history. And they're going through historical layers of positioning by opening with the current political discourse. Okay, so in the global history of colonialism, as I said, remain, uh, it remains West centric. It focuses on the colonies of the West, usually at this North South dichotomy with the missing Eastern Europe. Also, it is compartmentalized by nationalist histories or often captured by nationalist histories. There's also nationalist exceptionalism, like we were different. Uh, we never had colonies. This is usually what you have in Hungary if you ask anyone on the street. Uh, so, therefore, we have no responsibility for coloniality or the histories uh, and heritage of that. This is evading white guilt. It's often played out from the Hungarian position. Uh, but the Hungarian's place within the global history of racial colonialism has been selectively interpreted and it's really under-researched, often silent. Even there are no debates about Hungarian relations to colonialism in the public, which is kind of striking to me. 
uh, either you've been invited to such debates. Uh, the main discourse is exceptionalism, but I'd like to show that actually, if we follow a more structuralist or worse systemic uh, perspective, it's part of this in-between positioning, which is actually the reason for obscuring and denying the past relations, our relations to coloniality and race. And this is relationally played out depending on in what situation you are or Hungarians get into. Hungarians have also been uh, uh, racialized, orientalized, have been not quite white, not accepted in white Europe. Uh, a lot of our history is longing for the West, Western goodness, becoming white, mimicking or translating whiteness, proving to be, uh, proof to the West we are just as good or sometimes even better whites or more just whites. Uh, focus on race and colon colonial will show these historical continuities despite and going against political ruptures, so 1989, uh, 56th revolution, or whatever we may have. This is actually a critique of cultural history and the constructivist approach like othering, inspirationalism, and orientalism or nest orientalism. It's against the West centric conceptualizations of race. For example, think of US colorism in the sense of using the specific uh, references to color when identifying race. Um, and agency and positions here are structurally conditioned in interaction with the hegemonic core. So the semi peripheral position is a play between also attaining white positions dominantly, but sometimes playing non-white positions in order to contest uh, white hegemony. And these are sometimes mixed or combined. But I think that the semi peripherality concept uh, and here the political economic perspective really shows how racializations have are applied to devalue or create or extract value, capital, often symbolic capital, reproduce uh, uh, or contest class relations, strategies of accumulation too. It's also, we should remember that race is a geographical concept. So usually racialization is part of geographical competition. So these are played out against each other racializations. Uh, just another concept which I try to bring in is scaling race. So what does race mean on different levels? So local, regional, global. And what might be the advantages of aligning to wider global racial fantasies in the colonial world, as in the case of the Indian. So race is like upscaling ethnic identities or part of like resisting globalisms. And in my case, the Indian will be a perfect example to grasp this semi critical positioning dynamic because it's highly West centric, it represents or uh, produces this uh, longing for a faraway West, attaining freedom through colonial fantasies, but also pursuing an internal anti Western positioning within this West. So the Indian will be this kind of internal uh, anti Western position. So, just a bit on my work, if you're interested. I have a concept on transcoloniality, how colonial projects are connected and interacting geographically with each other uh, in this book. And also, you might be interested in the decolonizing history of group projects, which I founded as a social media group, which had 3,200 members now. And uh, we're working on a book which was mentioned um, here in coloniality. And this Indian story is a book chapter in the volume from Manchester University Press. Uh, volume edited by Catherine Baker, Bogdan Yaku, Aniko Imre, and James Mark, entitled Off White Central and Eastern Europe and the Global History of Race. And also, we did this exhibition. I won't talk about this, but if you're interested in the discussion on the transparent movements, uh, which is about the shared history of North East Europe and the Global South. And uh, this is just a few photos of the, the exhibition. It's also about Look, focusing on coloniality and peripherality and how that's shared in these histories. Also, another example of the Völkerkörperstoff, which is an experimental theater made into film, which is partly inspired by my work. There's also monologue and some aspects of uh, the Hungarian Indian involved, if you're interested. So there's a German, uh, German uh, uh, actors and the Hungarian crew and director, Leo Shimon. Okay, so I'll open with the uh, Orban, uh, under hot uh, scorching summer sun on 23rd June 2016, 
Orban held a speech in Transylvania in secular lands at the Tushvanish Festival, which is like a, has become a pilgrimage site for Fidesz politicians and government supporting people. Uh, talking usually it's about the Caucasian based in unity uh, and gives lectures about the Prime Minister gives lectures about the new course for Hungarian politics, like illiberalism was introduced here. At this in this talk, he talked about uh, the crisis of EU and way in the West, culture and civilization war. What was interesting is the open support for Donald Trump as presidential candidate. He also talked about Hungarian slavery. Hungarians don't want to be a nation of slaves, either other people or in their own country. And he went on about waging an anti colonial war for freedom against the period of Brussels, also keeping out the Islamic racialized non white migrants to escape racial mixing and to preserve a homogeneous white Hungarian nation. Now, white was often not identified here. But he connected uh, Western immigrationism and multiculturalism to a simple colonial past, which only the West has, and we don't want that. We, do, we don't have this past. And when making these uh, uh, remarks on demography, relation in relation to the USA, he identified Hungarians with the Indian. And actually, this was just a passing remark. He uh, referred to Tomas Cech, who was one of the Indian players during socialism from the 1960s onwards, and is widely remembered as you know, playing Indian and, uh, and have, has its heritage. Uh, but kind of translating Hungarian colonial experience to the Americans, and this was also in conversation with the reservation trope, which is highly connected to Transylvanian discourse under the Ceausescu regime. Hungarians as minorities sometimes uh, produce and in poetry, in literature, this kind of we are. Hungary reservation, right? Okay, so all this uh, is not only about like uh, looking back to this warrior figure of the masculine, you know, freedom loving uh, uh, Native American, but it's also part of this colonial discourse which has been constructed since 2012. This has this form of discourse which is anti Western, is also against the Imperial Brussels, it also has been mirrored by the opposition, so we don't want to be a colony of. The despised despotic East, uh, Russia, and China. Here you have uh, examples of the pro opposition protests against Chinese colonialism, but I don't want to go into details. We could talk about this. It's worth that uh, I could share the slides, so we will read about photos. Also, there's a, a, a heightening of uh, racial discourse. So, uh, the, the, the not providing us with new funds is is now commented as a sort of part of the racial revenge against Hungarians by the West. So this kind of racial identifications have been important. Also, it's contrasted against a uh, non-white South, which we must keep out, right? So in this discourse, there's also identification with non-white positions, as we can see, uh, cherishing this heritage of being part of Asia, Asia, so being this Asiatic nomadic people, which is a tradition which was supported, especially in the interwar era, by Turanism, which was this uh, related, it was related to Aryan theory, but it promoted Hungarian Asianness. So we are we have this essential Asian brother. So this and identification with the Hungarian national landscape as the pusta, as the wasteland, where we are most riding nomads, will connect to uh, the identifications with Indians. But to sum up, sorry, this is sum up. Uh, Orban we, uh, uh, often. Uh, uh, recurrently identifies Hungarian colonial moments as us fighting against the Ottomans, then the Habsburgs, which will be a case study like the two independence wars, uh, just two dates relating to this. Also, Trianon, so the big imperialist powers uh, uh, took away our land, and that will be connected to uh, identifying with the Native Americans. Uh, also, like Nazi and Soviet invasions, so Soviet Iran rule, and this kind of anti communist sentiment will be. So let's start with uh, the 1848 and colonial victimhood, just quickly. So coming from over the Great Water, uh, I'd just like to open with the example of Lesh Kushut. So the independence war against the Husbuns, uh in 1849 was, uh, has failed, had failed then. And Kushut did a round trip in 1851 and 52. In the Eastern States of USA to gather support for fighting against Habsburg colonialism and Hungarian slavery. So 1848 was like an igniting moment uh, for this kind of discourse of Hungary of uh, Habsburg colonialism. 
that it's a colonial relation that we must contest. He gained the spotlight, uh, pushing also met bourgeois Native American activists like George Otway, who praised his cause. And there are a lot of anecdotes on pushing them. The Indians, like in this example, in this calendar, political calendar, uh, where you can see Koshik meeting the so-called Indians. Uh, it's interesting that he decided not to meet with the black Afro-American delegation, but not to lose the sympathy of southern plantation owners. So he was attacked from many sides because of that, so he was protesting against some year slavery, and also tyranny. Uh, so he had this quarrel with radical abolitionists. So interestingly, the Indian was there as an identification, but not the blacks. There's an exception, so after in Hungary, there was actually a huge cult uh, 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 around uh, Uncle Tom's cabin. Harry Beecher Stowe actually hosted Hungarian refugees in her house, and he, uh, she uh, injected parts uh, referring to Hungarian uh, freedom cause in, in her book, which became like a popular tome for uh, uh, abolitionists. Okay, uh, not going to go into detail. But uh, the other example, which will follow up this stroke, will be Yanis Santos, who also fought in the war. And uh, this Indian solidarity culminated with him. So uh, he was caught as prisoner of war in Transylvania and managed to escape to London, then fled to the USA. And in the Western frontier, started collecting animal and black specimens, stuffed them, they, and sent ethnographic artifacts, uh, especially to the Smithsonian U uh, Institution, which was founded in 1846, around that time, the Hungarian National Museum. He published his letters and travel experience regularly uh, and with two books. Upon his return, he became a national hero, and allegedly he was the influence for Kalmai's old Chatterhand figure, which this narrative started in the 1970s, and they found some evidence. But it's up for discussion how to interpret these sources. So Santos' anecdotic encounter with the Indians, which was replicated many times during his survey and would negotiate land with Seminole tribe, who were resettled from Florida to Oklahoma uh, in 1842 after eight years of war, and when the suspicious chieftain is told that Santos is a refugee from over the great water, he replies, you are a true Nekam, so a good friend, because you, just as we were driven from our homeland, and offers his friendship. So this is like a good example of the anecdotes which were replicated. So there's also, so he's presented as, as one wielding the guiding light of enlightened humanism, how anti uncle patriot, uh, who can mediate. Uh, he's also presented as a secular world traveler because he originated from secular family in, in Chittapolza, so his family was from there. So he's imagined often in this kind of, but this is another discourse to why the secular people were part of this global imaginaries of globalism as world travelers. Uh, Santos' biographers uh, often downplay uh, his participation in the colonial project, so there's a doctor colonial re reality working behind this roast into the accounts of anti-colonial friendship. Uh, Santos assisted in mapping and surveying for land grabbing at the colonial frontier, part of, which is part of a mission to consolidate the Indian Kansas for white settlement. 50s. The Smithsonian Institution model was also mentioned. Based, it grew based on meeting of Native Americans and on the frontier by travelers, explorers, scientists, agents of the Ministry of Agriculture and Bureau of Indian Affairs, etc. Also, Hungarians tried to the refugees tried to settle in New Buda, so it was a colony established in Iowa to preserve and like restart over the Hungarian. Republic, which failed at home. So we could also talk about the role of Hungarian settlers in the U.S., who, who also met Indians or the Na Native Americans. But there was also the Budapest Zoo, uh, which was in comp imperial competition with Vienna and Schoenbrunn, and it did exhibit Indian shows featuring tribes as part of the CEO European Tour in 1886. Uh, and Santos, uh, who admired British imperial colonialism and also American bourgeois development, uh, kind of promoted this show as you know, him as an authentic figure who has been there and, and these people. We could also talk about the socialist period in reinterpretations, interestingly, uh, under the anti-colonialist and anti-racist so, uh, socialism. Uh, they quickly rehabilitated a few figures, including 
like they were you know Koshul. Koshul was really popular because Habsburg colonialism discourse was promoted uh, and exploited in order to position Hungary within Afro-Asia in relation to Afro-Asian decolonization as having a shared history of being a colonial colonial victim of the West, in this case the Austrians, but also the Germans and the Nazi occupation. So there's a problematic continuity of this quick rehabilitation. They present to them these are national achievements in competition with others and also like scientific disinterested uh, results. Uh, today, despite the Prime Minister's regular reference to national victimhood through applying anti Western rhetoric, Eastern have been more West centric. So, this is an example from a recent roundtable. Uh, the main discourse from them, or, or what they say, statements that it wasn't actually about protecting Christianity, but it was about forming Central Europe. It was more about religious conflict uh, than restoring national unity. The Ottomans were actually the ones who looted you know, Hungary. Husband, husband actually protected, provided, and organized. The communist role in the Habsburg colonialism narrative is century. So they, mostly they argue that it was a communist period that you know heightened this, that emphasized this. There's no reflection on global imperialism and colonialism, how many years related to that. Now I have various other examples which I don't want to go into because of the lack of time. So I just want to show you one example and then speak to the to the recent memory politics in one or two minutes. So afterwards, this kind of colonial victimhood uh, uh, feeded into this kind of nationalist arguments for victimhood after Trianon when empire was lost. So the Indian troop was often used as, they were tokenized some cases like Tibish which was mentioned by uh, Jonathan in the introduction. Some of these people, if, be, if they are Christians, they can, you know, they're allowed to speak. They were used as uh, 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 spokespersons for Hungarian revisionism. And not only Tibish Goyi, which is a good example, uh, if the Hungarian uh, uh, tour that he did is not included in his biography, by the way. Only, uh, I have to speak a few slides. Uh, also, the Boy Scouts movement kind of exploited this through the Indian press movement. Uh, making parallels with Indian destiny, so Hungarian and Indian destiny. Uh, and also, like, uh, there was even a march of allegedly 600 Hopi people who were persuaded to support Hungarian justice. Like, they took a march to Arizona, and actually this booklet in English, Justice Hungary, was translated into Hopi language. And I promise I'll stop in a few minutes, but Behind this was actually this guy who's widely claimed in Hungary for you know, promoting Indian claim, identifying with Indians, uh, Shandor Gorbeling Deskash, also called this white here. And his approach was very interesting because it was more about racial brotherhood. And in his case, and in some cases, they, uh, they uh, also uh, referred to Hungary as being Turanic people, as being this nomadic nation. So we have this in common with the Indian. So therefore, they, in the Hungarian case, the East becomes the West in this way. It's interesting how these racial positionings, non-white positionings, uh, you know, reinforce each other. Okay, I'll skip to the last, to the ending. So I'm going to skip these because they're not important for my argument now. That today, what you have is basically this statement. There's there's a deep and hidden resonance uh, between you know Hungarians and Indian destiny. So it's widely supported by many cultural workers and also, uh, so it's not something that, like only Victor Orban says. And uh, they reach back to, and they're nationalizing a lot of these collections. For one example, the Czech, uh, Tomasz Czech collection has been bought by the Petit Literary Museum, which is a largely state, with such people and largely state support, government supported institution. Also, they have published a lot on this, on Hungarian Union play, if you're interested. And I'm going to finish with the exhibition. So, the In the Corporate Skin Twilight is a recent exhibition. Uh, and this will be uh, my conclusion. Uh, actually, the, it's a quote. So, it's a quote from a, a poet called Mikul Shrat, widely acclaimed. So, the title is kind of racist, but we have to think of, so they're using this as a quote. So kind of escaping this criticism, I think, of whether it's okay to refer 
to Native American copper spin kit, and they're relegating all these memories of Hungarian Indian play into childhood memory. So it was our childhood, and we all liked freedom and playing Indians. It was about freedom, and mo most all of what you, which is mobilized in this memory is the anti-communist stance. So during socialism, this Indian trope became part of like a subculture of contesting authoritarian uh, 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 communist state. And this is the only part that's remembered. The fact that how how the Indian figure was politicized in the interwar era is highly de-emphasized. So this is one of the problems of like how they're constructing white innocence in the Hungarian case. Although I like like to conclude with the fact that we have to be aware of this play with white and non-white positions and how it's actually played out by uh, in-government propaganda to relate to various regions in the world. So they might use Tyrannism, for example, in the, global, in the opening to East kind of foreign policy in Hungary. And in the case of the Indians, uh, what I can see is there's a total lack of dialogue with North Americans themselves, so we might talk about that in the future. Thank you so much.